seated. Open up to Matthew 6. Matthew 6. I think the, the cold weather is going to Got to keep some folks home and uh, from getting out. We did. Can, we cancel way more for tomorrow because a lot of those folks walk up there. And I was looking. I, I didn't realize uh, that it was supposed to get cold when it was supposed to get cold. But uh, about the time Waymar would start, it's going to be negative 11. So I thought, well, we, we can't have that. So, but uh, the cold, I was thinking we should put on the sign, it's warm inside. And maybe we have people stop in. But. Matthew 6, 25. We got the handouts there in the back, so you can grab one of those. Last week, we looked at, also here in Matthew 6, we saw Christ's teaching regarding investments in eternal things. We talked about how kind of uh, <coughs> Christ's teachings on investments and securities. The physical things that we hoard on earth, verse 19 and 20, are subject to loss from natural causes or the devices of men. Everything that you own, there's something that can get it. There's uh, the, the metal goods that we own are subject to rust and, and corrosion. The food goods that we own are subject to mice and moth, our clothes, everything. If it was made by man, it can be destroyed by earthly causes. Jesus warned his disciples, who for purposes of this study, we've, we've used the word citizens of the kingdom, because that's what he's talking to. That they need to maintain an eternal focus. They need to serve God rather than to seek earthly treasures. But even as I was studying this, maybe you've heard this phrase or something close to this phrase. That money isn't everything, but it sure keeps the kids in touch. You've heard something to that effect, right? That money isn't everything. And that's what Jesus, the point Jesus just made in verses 19 to 24. But... We understand that while we're not to make the accumulation of worldly goods our focus, how are we supposed to get along from day to day? That's, that's the question that Jesus is going to answer. You could, you could phrase the question this way. If I don't look out for myself, no one else is going to do it, right? Because we're not, uh, I, I'm not going to stand up here tonight and say, well, it's government's job. No, it's God would have us to, to care for for ourselves through industry and through through doing the right things. But Jesus is going to deal with these concerns that would have, perhaps, as he was speaking that day, perhaps they would have been unvoiced, but we're certainly going through the minds and the thoughts of his audience. And we start off in verse 25 with a command to take no thought. He says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? So therefore, that word is connecting it uh, to the verses that come just prior. So in this case, specifically, if we want to get real, real tight in the context, verse 19 to verse 24. In light of the fact that moth and rust and thieves can take and steal and corrupt, what should you do? Well... Take no thought for your life. That word, take no thought. The word thought is the word uh, that means to be anxious, to be troubled, to worry. So Jesus is telling his disciples, those who would be citizens of the kingdom, hey, don't worry, don't be anxious. Anxious. That's the adjective form of anxiety. Mm -hmm. To be anxious. Anxiety is something that we hear a great deal of. In 2022, in a poll that was taken in 2020, I found this to be interesting. Uh, I, I don't put just a ton of stock in some of the political polls, but this one I would think is probably fairly close to accurate. If anything, maybe conservative. <laughs> in a 2020 poll, 47% of participants claim to experience regular anxiety. 47%, that's almost 5 out of 10 people. Generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, and the list goes on and on and on and on. There's uh, <laughs> post-traumatic stress disorder, which is what many people who go to combat or, or first responders deal with. But now we have people who say they suffer from PTSD, 
from all manner of, of things that I would question. What you're suffering PTSD from from that and, and, and all of these anxieties that we have, all of these disorders that we have, Jesus is going to, to speak about this. He puts his finger on some specific sources of anxiety here in this verse. He says, take no thought for your life. Now that's a general umbrella term. He's, hey, hey, look, if, if it has to do with your life, don't worry about it. That goes against the way the world would have us to think. That goes... That deals with an awful lot of the disorders that the world has. This, take no thought for your life. This is a general, all-encompassing term. But then he gets a little bit more specific. What ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, food and food and drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Now, all of those are necessities, aren't they? You cannot do without clothing, you cannot do without food, and you must have liquid. All of these also relate to the physical. That's of note. All of these relate to the physical. You eat food because it keeps your it keeps your caloric intake up and it gives you energy. You drink food or you drink water because you're ninety some percent water, right? You you have to put on clothing because it keeps you sheltered from the elements. All of these are physical. He says, "Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? The substance of life." is more than caring for the body. Even meeting the body's legitimate need is not to be our foremost thought and concern. We are not to be anxious, to worry, to be unduly concerned about even food and water and clothing. <laughs> God placed us here on earth for a purpose. Making your ultimate goal in life the care of the body. Now, we should care for our body. I'm going to make that point in just a moment. But making the ultimate goal of your life, the care of the body, is the, the same cycle as somebody who has a car so they can get to work, so they can have a car, so they can get to work. Okay. If your ultimate goal is, I live to keep my body nice, you're, you're stuck in that cycle. And Jesus is making that point. Now, again, Jesus is not forbidding the care of the body. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 4 says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, speaking of the body, in sanctification and honor. 1 Corinthians 6 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. Ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. And spirit, which is God, which are God's. Okay, so the body is important. He goes on. First, First Timothy four eight. This verse gets pulled to say nonsense quite regularly. <laughs> For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. There are people who have pulled this verse out, saying, "Well, see, the Bible says you don't need to exercise." Because no, 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 you're missing the point. Bodily exercise. Profiteth. It just doesn't profit ultimately. It does profit a little. We should care for our bodies. They are the temple of the Holy Ghost. I should care for my body, but my ultimate goal is the service of the Lord. If I'm distracted by worry and anxiety about my physical well-being, then I'm going to lose sight of the ultimate goal. And so to further make his point... That we are to have a divine focus and not live for the temporal. He, said, he gives some examples of his divine care. Look at verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, the birds. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? So one need look no further than the birds to see the care of of God. God cares for his creation. He provides for their needs. Matthew 10, 29. Here in the same gospel, he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. God takes care of creation. When, when you go and you, you sit outside, as you sit in a tree stand or you, or you just go for a walk and you see creation. Think of the moving parts to keep 
just the animals on your property alive. Just, and I'm not talking, you, Preston and, and Reggie, they've got cows and they've got, they've got critters like that. But think about all of the other critters that are on your land that you have that, are, that, that the Lord takes care of. You don't put out feed for the squirrels, do you? No, <laughs> no, but they eat, don't they? Why? Because God takes care of these. Jesus isn't preaching in this case where he says that they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Again, Jesus is not preaching against preparing and laying in store for difficult times. But if your constant fear is, what if, what if I don't have enough? That's anxiety. That's worry. Don't do it. <coughs> but, but as is the case quite regularly, if anxiety because I'm worried that I don't have enough is wrong, what would be the ditch on the other side of the road that would be wrong? Well, it would be the, I got it. I got this in hand. I don't have to worry about a thing. Have you seen what I've got in my safe? Have you seen what I've got in my closet? Both sides of that equation are wrong. What should I do? I, I should be wise. There's, there's nothing wrong with having enough food in your home to sustain you if you, if you have to be home for a period of time. Barry and I were talking. Uh, right now, apparently, all the stores are empty because we're getting, we're getting a blizzard. Did you know that? And everybody went and bought, well, well what did they always buy? They buy bread and milk and eggs. We always used to joke that nothing like snow to make people want French toast, right? <laughs> they, they go and they hoard this stuff. There's nothing wrong with having what you need in your house. But there's something wrong with depending on it. And there's something wrong with being in anxiety about it. We need to live in a state of constant dependence, knowing that the Lord is ultimately the one who provides. Why are the birds not on anxiety medication? Well, if they have the most basic instinct to trust in their creator to meet their needs, then why do we get all in a divot? They're birds, but they trust. Verse 27, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? What's the answer? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> You can't, if you sit and you think about it and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow 18 inches. <laughs> nope. Nope. You can't even grow an inch by thinking about it. If your worry can't add a few inches to your physical height, what makes you think that your worry is going to extend your life? If, if medicine knows anything, it would say that what does worry actually do to your life? It, it shortens it. So if my worry can't make me taller, it's certainly not going to help me with anything of, of lasting value. Worry, somebody once said, is like a rocking chair. It keeps you busy, but you don't go anywhere. That's really what it is. That's what Jesus is saying. Verse 28, and why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. <laughs> they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Jesus has used the birds as an example of his care for their sustenance, for food. Now Jesus uses the plants as an example of his provision for clothing and the other basic essentials. How, of what lasting consequence is the flower that grows up in your grass? It's of no lasting consequence. And yet God clothes it in, in greater beauty. If you get down there and you look at it, which would, would be odd to do on a regular basis, but I'd encourage you to do it occasionally. Look at God's handiwork. Look at what he's done. The Bible tells us in, in one of the poetical books to not, not uh, look down on the day of small things. You get down and you look at, at a little flower. You get down and you look at, at what you would consider a weed. God takes awfully good care of something that you run over with a mower a couple times a week to keep it down. And if God is willing to do that, then how much more is he going to care for you, who's the, the, the crown jewel of his creation? If God's going to care for birds, if God's going to care for grass, God's going to care for us too. Our creator gives attendance to the minute details 
of maintaining even the little things. So what's the expected behavior? In light of this fact, which Jesus has used uh, verse 5 through verse 30 to make the point, look, I take care of things that don't matter. And I put that in quotes. Every, everything matters in the sight of God. But God says, look, I care for the things that that are of no consequence, I'm certainly going to care for you. So what should we do in light of that? Verse 31. Therefore, in light of what I just said, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Now, Jesus is giving this sermon on a hillside in Galilee, which means that the vast majority of his audience are Jews or Gentiles? Jews. Jews, okay? So Jesus' Jewish audience, when he says, after all these things do the Gentiles seek, what do you think they would have thought? <laughs> they, they'd have bristled a little bit. No, 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 I'm not like the Gentiles. There's no way that I'm like the Gentiles. Worry is a hallmark of the citizens of this world. There's an excellent example of Jesus teaching in the life of Abraham, who is the father of the Jews. Notice what he said. If you remember, back, we did this when we were over here at the school during our renovation. And I remember covering this over there. Hebrews 11.8 is from the Hall of Faith. And it says, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What was Abraham's primary focus in life? It was pleasing Jehovah. Pleasing the Lord. That was what he lived for. That was what he was willing to die for. That's what he was willing to offer his son for. You remember all of this. Abraham did not live for the temporal. Did God meet Abraham's needs? In spades. Absolutely. He, he more than met Abraham's needs. But Abraham, a very wealthy man, lived in tents his whole life. Why? Because... He, he wasn't worried about it. You know what? If the Lord calls me to go somewhere, I'm good with it. I, he'll take care of it. If God orders it, then God will pay for it. Abraham concerned himself with absolute <laughs> obedience. He left the details and the consequences of that obedience in the hands of God. If I were to say, you're going to be taking a trip next week, your first question would be, where? where? Okay? That would be my first question. But God told Abraham, I want you to pull up roots, and I, he's not taking a trip. I want you to move. I want you to take you, and I want you to take your wife, and I want you to leave everybody behind, and I want you to move. Where, Lord? I'll show you. He rented the truck without knowing where he was going to drop it off. That's faith. That's a man who, who had a hold of these principles that Jesus is preaching all these thousand and some years later as Jesus says, take no thought. Don't, don't worry about your food. Did God feed Abraham? Absolutely. Did Abraham didn't, didn't want for something to drink? Abraham didn't want for clothing to wear? Abraham didn't really want for anything. God provided all of it. Abraham was content to <coughs> live in a tent because he wasn't focused on the here and now but rather on the future that was as bright as the promises of God. So God knows that you have needs. And God is able to meet those needs. And he's able to, to help you. And your worry doesn't, doesn't make the process go better. <laughs> I've talked to people who have literally said, I know God's in control. I just can't stop worrying about it. <laughs> One of those statements is true. The other is not. If you can't stop worrying about it, then, then you haven't truly placed it fully in the hands of God. Don't worry about it. Take no thought. Don't be anxious. That's hard for us. Rather, rather than that, our first priority, verse 33, very, very well-known verse, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. 
our, our series here that we've been going through. We're calling it Kingdom Life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All what things? In the immediate context, what's he talking about? Starting in verse 25, he's talking about food, drink, clothing. If you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things shall be added unto you. Maybe you remember Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. David said in Psalm 37.25, I've been young and now I'm old. Yet have not I seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. God has a good track record caring for his children. God can care for birds. God can care for mice. God can care for the, for the grass and the flowers. He's certainly not going to let you fall off without his knowledge. Rather than being consumed with anxiety about the essential provisions of life, I'm to seek first the kingdom of God and leave the, leave the essentials in his hands. Speaking of the difficulties that he faced in the service of Christ, Paul said in Acts 20, 24, but none of these things move me. Did Paul lead an easy life? No. Did he have reason to, from a human standpoint, did he have reason sometimes to doubt where his food and his water and his raiment would come from? Absolutely. But he says, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. To, to put it in words that Jesus has already used in this sermon, if you look back at chapter 5, verse 6, in the Beatitudes, he says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Here it comes again. Same, same idea. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. One last verse here. We'll close out this chapter. Look at verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. One of the commentaries I was looking at refers to this verse as God's social security program. It's a good way to look at it. You live with his kingdom as your number one priority, and he'll meet the needs you face. Is that a good deal? Lord, I'm going to seek you first. I'm going to seek the advancement of your kingdom, and I'm genuinely going to leave the, leave the rest up to you. There's a book going around. I don't. It's, it's long, long ago printed that talks about don't sweat the small stuff. And then I think the tagline is, and it's all small stuff. <laughs> In reality, it is, with the one exception of, Seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Take no thought. It's the same word used in verse 25. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Somebody very wisely remarked that tomorrow only exists on your calendar. It's true. In light of that fact, and in light of what we've looked at here in verse 34, I'm to put all of my worries off until tomorrow. Okay? You say, I'm going, to worry about, I'm going to worry about it tomorrow. And, and when tomorrow comes, what should you do? You just put it off till tomorrow. You have a divine order to indefinitely procrastinate your schedule of worries. I'm, I'm, I'll worry about that tomorrow. I'll worry about it. You've heard somebody say, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. It's a good way to look at your worries. I'll cross that bridge when I come to it, and I'm just going to leave it in the hands of God. He says, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. It's enough for me to place all of today's issues in the hands of God without reaching into the future to worry about what may or may not be. If you look at the if if you're trying to predict the future right now, it's bleak. <coughs> but the thing of it is is you look at the future and let you look at it in economics or you look at it in in social social issues or you look at it in in world conflict you could worry but you're worried you you might be worried about something that doesn't happen 
Today, the stock market ended on a good note, pretty good place. But, but tomorrow, what if it doesn't? It, it might not, but worrying about it won't change anything. Rather than this, trade in your worry for trust. Indefinitely procrastinate worrying. I'll, do, I'll, I'll worry later, some other, tomorrow. And tomorrow, do it tomorrow, and indefinitely follow. Corey Ten Boom. I've got a quote for you there. Corey Ten Boom was a woman who knew about trouble and uncertainty. She was part of a Dutch family that hid Jews from the Nazis during World War II. Uh, if you've ever heard the movie or the book, The Hiding Place, that's written about her family. They got caught. And she and her family were put into concentration camps. Her sister died in the Nazi concentration camps. But as a woman who knew what it was to have an uncertain tomorrow, and she did, she said, worrying is carrying tomorrow's load with today's strength, carrying two days at once. It's moving into tomorrow ahead of time. Worrying doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strengths. That's a good way to look at it. You can worry about tomorrow, or you can just say, you know what, I'm going to give it to the Lord. And give today to the Lord, too. You don't need to worry about today. You just place it in the hands of God. You say, I'm going to keep my focus on Him and advancing His kingdom. And leave the details up to Him. And He has a way of dealing with all of that in a much better way than we could have anyway.